She was one of the great female leaders of the 20th century, the famous grandmother of the Jewish people and the Iron Lady of the Middle East. Her life story resembles an epic, but without a happy ending. It was one of hardship and tragedy, principles and pioneering, and great strength and bravery in the face of adversity. For Golda Meir, nay Golda Mabovich, there was always a cause, always a battle to be won, and justice to be served. For nearly 50 years, she gave her heart and soul to the founding, building and defense of Israel, a key pillar in the nation's pre-state and early history. To the international community, the frumpy looking grandmother with the signature hair bun and mandatory handbag wherever she went, was and remains an icon. She was something of a lioness, highly protective of her cubs, and dangerous when threatened. But to many Israelis today, she's something of a bittersweet antiquity, part of the old socialist utopian guard of Israeli politics. Above all, her tenure as Israel's fourth prime minister is associated with the calamity of the Yom Kippur War in 1973, a conflict which cost the lives of over 2,500 Israeli soldiers, and many would say in vain due to an incompetent government being unprepared for the Arab invasion. Her eventful and tumultuous life will be the subject of this entire video. For those who are new to this channel, welcome. Here we look at the personalities of historic figures, always starting off with a bio. Part two of this series will explore Golda Meir in depth, analyzing her strengths and flaws, habits and foibles, as well as her views, complete with anecdotes and testimonies from her life. But enough chit chat, let's dive right in. No clock this time. Year of birth, 1898, place of birth, Kiev, at the time part of the Russian Empire. The daughter of Bloom Nidich and Moshe Mabovich, a carpenter by trade, Golda Mabovich grew up in poverty and in a climate of violent anti-Semitism. Cossack raids and pogroms were constant threats for Jewish families in Tsarist Russia. She had two sisters who would survive into adulthood, Shana, nine years Golda's senior, and Clara, three years her junior. Her five other siblings, all born before her, died before the age of two. Fleeing hardship and persecution, Mother Bloom and the Mabovich children left for the United States in 1906, when Golda was eight years old. They joined Moshe, who was then working in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, having left for the New World just three years prior to seek out work. There, the family carried on struggling to make ends meet. Golda, a brilliant elementary student, was pulled in to help in her mother's grocery store. She would grow up despising this job, particularly as it interfered with her cherished schoolwork. Shana, the eldest sister, was by then quite the political animal. She was mingling with revolutionary crowds, mainly passionate advocates of socialism, gender equality, and more importantly, Zionism. Zionism, put crudely, is the belief in a Jewish nationality and identity and the right of the Jewish people to have a state in the historic and biblical land of Israel. Heated confrontations with her more traditionally minded parents led Shana to move out of the family home and leave for Denver, Colorado. Little Golda would later follow in her footsteps. Her own relationship with her parents was increasingly heated. They didn't want Golda to have a secondary education, least of all carry out her wishes to become a teacher. They preferred her to marry young, embrace traditional motherhood, and work with Bloom full-time in the grocery store. Golda said no. In 1913, aged 15 and encouraged by her elder sister, she slipped out of the family home for Denver, leaving only a postcard with her destination. The next few months were some of the most formative of her life. Shana's revolutionary friends opened Golda up to the world of politics, with passionate debates every day until the early hours of the morning. It was in this environment where she also met her future husband, Morris. Though politically inclined, the soft-spoken introvert was far more interested in art, literature, and music than revolution. Golda was smitten with Morris and their intimacy, through which, by her words, she learned all the beautiful things, led her to quarrel with Shana. After a particularly heated argument one night, Golda simply left Shana's home, eventually finding an apartment of her own. Her newfound independence came with increased association with Zionism and radical politics, but also economic instability and little advances in her education. A few badly paid menial jobs later, in December 1914, on her mother's insistence, she returned to her parents' home in Milwaukee. Her parents allowed her to pursue her secondary education, graduating in February 1916 before training to become a teacher. She married Morris in 1917, who
who moved to Denver as well. The next year, she fell pregnant and had a backstreet abortion. Fairly quickly, she fell out of love with teaching, instead devoting all her time and energies into the Labour Zionist movement in the United States, becoming a party member at age 17. Labour Zionism, again put crudely, was a sort of utopian fusion of socialism with the principles of Zionism. The idea was to build an Israeli state on the backs of a united Jewish working class, engaged in collective agricultural and industrial work. It became the bedrock of Golda's politics, and that of many leading figures in the foundation of Israel. Travelling from city to city and speaking before medium and large crowds, she evolved into a highly effective public speaker and a skilled, dynamic administrator for the movement. As her activism progressed, her ideological calling beckoned with every passing day the inevitable move to Palestine. Since the end of World War I, the West Asian region had been administered by the British and was known as Mandatory Palestine. Morris was a little bit lukewarm about the fundamentals of Zionism. Quote, the idea of Palestine or any other territory for the Jews is to me ridiculous. Racial persecution does not exist because some nations have no territories, but because nations exist at all. But he was completely committed to Golda. In 1921, they travelled to Palestine from the US via Italy and Egypt. After a short spell in Tel Aviv, the couple joined a kibbutz. For those who don't know, a kibbutz is a collective agricultural community, a tightly knit group of Jewish labourers working the land in the region of Palestine. It was one of the model socialist micro-societies for Labour Zionists, and Golda relished the opportunity. The months that followed at Kibbutz Mahavia in northern Israel were ones of hard work picking almonds, planting trees, running the kitchen, and many more tasks on a rotational basis. For Golda, it symbolised state building, collectivism, real purpose. For Morris, it was country bumpkins, sunburns, and repeated bouts of malaria. When Golda wanted to have children, Morris put his foot down. No way was he raising his children under the rules and communal nature of the kibbutz. So in September 1923, they moved back to Tel Aviv, and later to Jerusalem. They barely made ends meet with odd administrative and menial jobs while raising their two children, Menachem and Sarah, born in 1923 and 1926. Tedium, lack of purpose, and frustration with traditional gender roles marked much of Golda's thinking during these years. In 1928, however, her life to change forever, when she was offered the position of secretary on the Women's Labour Council of the Histadrut, the Histadrut being the main organisation for Jewish trade unions in Palestine. It gave her a foothold into the Jewish political elite under the British administration, and she went on to play an ever-increasing role in developing the Labour Party, as well as creating the State of Israel. The following years were ones of non-stop conferences, talks, and travels across Jewish communities, as well as to and from the United States. She crisscrossed the US, leading fundraising initiatives, raising awareness about women's communities in Palestine, and generally encouraging American Jews to migrate. Before long, she was giving tours to important international dignitaries and wealthy philanthropists, showing them the achievements of the Jewish trade unions across Palestinian farms and towns. She was increasingly active dealing with unemployment policies and workers' rights, particularly workers in British army camps. She worked tirelessly, her children suffered in her absence. It wasn't unusual for her to be away for months on end. They therefore treasured the little time she could spend with them, sometimes even attending Labour Party meetings just to see their mother. As for Morris, his and Golda's marriage grew cold and distant, with all the time spent apart. Golda also started having several affairs with prominent Labour politicians, some perhaps overlapping. By 1935, she and Morris had split, albeit without arranging a divorce, leaving Morris and the children devastated. Golda would keep a photo of Morris close to her bed for the rest of her life. A loving father with a brilliant mind, and as Golda reminisced, a beautiful soul, Morris Myerson passed away in 1951. But Golda's fall out of love and her fiery affairs didn't distract her from her work. In 1935, she was elected to the Secretariat, placing her in the very inner circle of the Histadrut. Thereafter, she was active in laying out the foundations for the Mapai Party, established by David Ben-Gurion some five years earlier, and which would dominate Israeli politics until the late 1960s, before it coalesced with other factions of the Israeli labour movement. In 1940, at the onset of World War II, Golda was invited by the British authorities to join the War Economic Advisory Council, where she advised on issues such as resource allocation and food rationing. As European Jews under Nazi-controlled territories faced 
increased persecution and before long annihilation, Golda was a key voice in pleading British authorities and international heads of state to rescue and grant asylum to as many Jews as possible. The vast majority of global powers refused. Britain, in fact, tightened restrictions on Jewish migration to Palestine. This was to pacify Palestinian Arabs who had mounted what's now known as the Great Arab Revolt between 1936 and 1939, demanding self-rule but also an end to the open-end migration of Jews. Meir became involved in a double-edged war on two fronts. On the one hand, she led a successful campaign recruiting young Jewish men into the British Army or Navy and supplied resistance fighters in Europe with weapons. At the same time, she played a lead role in a covert resistance movement against the British, defying immigration quotas by arranging for the transportation of Jews en masse to Palestine. En Brera, Hebrew for We Have No Alternative, was a rallying chant, becoming a party slogan for decades. There is no alternative but freedom, no alternative but survival, no choice but life. As the war raged, reports of the concentration and extermination camps amassed, particularly from the illegal Jewish refugees. By 1945, many of the camps were liberated by the Allies, and the true scale of the Holocaust was unveiled to the world. Six million Jews had been massacred under the Nazi regime. Despite this, Britain wouldn't budge on its immigration policy. Haganah, the Zionist paramilitary force under the British mandate, rebelled openly in acts of sabotage. Mayer also spearheaded a policy of non-cooperation with the British, fasting in protest. The policy failed. Palestinian Jews needed Britain for economic, political and military aid, even despite the agonising migration quotas turning their backs on Britain amounted to political suicide. Besides, at the 1945 Yalta Conference, it was decreed that all mandate territories of the soon-to-be-defunct League of Nations would be handed over to its post-war successor, the United Nations. The Holocaust had galvanised the world into accepting the urgency of a Jewish homeland. In 1947, two years after the end of World War II, the British, who were also anxious to withdraw from the region, given the growing hostilities between Jews and Arabs, referred the Palestinian question to a special UN delegation. Golda was chief delegate for Israel at this committee. Through a UN resolution passed on the 29th of November 1947, the region of Palestine was split between Arab and Jewish territories. When war with the Arab states seemed imminent as a result of this resolution, it became clear that Israelis needed funding if they were to survive the onslaught. Golda was sent to the United States to raise funds. It was thought that only five to seven million dollars could be raised, and even with that sum, the government feared the Jews would be overrun. After six weeks of non-stop touring around the country, Golda raised 50 million dollars. Years later, Israel's first Prime Minister, Ben Gurion, would write, Someday, when history will be written, it will be said that there was a Jewish woman who got the money which made the state possible. Israel declared its independence on the 14th of May 1948. Its statehood was recognised by the United States that same day. Golda, though not a member of Ben-Gurion's provisional government, was one of 200 people invited to sign the Declaration of Independence. She was in tears while signing it. When somebody asked her why she couldn't stop crying, she said, because my heart breaks when I think of all those who were supposed to be here and are not. The next day, on the 15th of May, a coalition of five Arab states crossed the borders of the former Palestinian mandate, setting in motion the first Israeli-Arab war. The coalition hoped to set up a fully Arab state within the borders of mandatory Palestine. Golda was sent on yet another fundraising mission to the United States. This time, she raised an astounding $75 million. The war would rage for another 10 months. Israel emerged victorious, and it is now remembered as their War of Independence. They retained the Jewish territories granted in the UN Resolution of 1947 and pushed beyond the allotted borders, claiming land west of Jerusalem as well as in the southwest and north of the former British Mandate. For Arabs, this war is remembered as Anakba, or the catastrophe, on account of the huge number of refugees and uprooted people as a result of the war, their descendants numbering in the millions today. Throughout most of this period, Golda was acting as ambassador to the Soviet Union, a post she held for seven months. Though diplomacy was complicated by the repressive and anti-Semitic policies of Stalin's superstate, her term opened her eyes to the plight and unexpected unity of the East European Jews under Soviet rule. 
and she would champion their rights and eventual migration to Israel for the rest of her life. When she returned in April 1949, she became a member of parliament and was appointed Minister of Labour and Housing. Her seven year tenure until 1956 marked one of her greatest contributions to the state of Israel. She oversaw housing for the hundreds of thousands of Jews who poured into the new country after the announcement of the UN resolution. During her tenure, 200,000 apartments and 30,000 houses were built not to mention roads, hospitals, schools, and other crucial infrastructure. Golda helped build Israel's welfare state, founded on some of the key principles of labor Zionism. She was instrumental in elaborating Israel's national insurance policy, still in use today, providing social security, programs for maternity benefits, and other welfare plans. In 1956, she was appointed foreign minister. It was at this point when Golda, who until then had taken Morris's surname, Myerson, took on a Hebrew surname on the insistence of Prime Minister David Ben-Gurion. Henceforth, she became known as Golda Meir. Foreign Minister from 1956 until 1965, her term saw the Suez Crisis of 1956, when Egyptian President Gamal Abdel Nasser nationalised the foreign-owned Suez Canal Company. In retaliation, Britain and France, the main shareholding countries, formed a military coalition to overthrow Nasser's regime. Egypt's blockade on Israeli shipping in the Gulf of Aqaba, its encouragement of attacks on Israeli citizens by Palestinian militants, or Fayyadeen, and the fact that it had joined its high command to that of Sirius were seen by Israel as signs of imminent war. In late October 1956 into early November, the Israeli army pushed into the Gaza Strip and the Sinai Peninsula, destroying swathes of the Egyptian army. Golda led the Israeli delegation in the UN, convincing UN officials of Israeli security needs. Ultimately, Israeli forces withdrew from the Sinai Peninsula. The UN would monitor the Gaza Strip, and Israeli shipping in the Gulf of Aqaba and the Straits of Tehran would go unhindered. Another crucial issue which dogged her tenure as foreign minister was the refugee crisis. Over 700,000 Arab Palestinians had been uprooted and displaced from the war in Palestine in 1948. The Arab states refused to host the refugees. An official resolution from a conference on refugees in 1957 read as follows. Any discussion aimed at a solution of the Palestine problem, which will not be based on ensuring the refugees' right to annihilate Israel, will be regarded as a desecration of the Arab people and an act of treason. This view was echoed in official pronouncements by nearly all the major Middle Eastern Arab states. Israel, meanwhile, refused to grant asylum to the refugees, fearing a very likely fifth column within its borders. In this deadlock, Arab-Israeli relations carried on deteriorating. Isolated from its neighbours and with unreliable alliances with Western powers, Israel looked to the developing world, particularly Africa. A shared history of tragedy, oppression and discrimination created friendly alliances with African leaders. Because Israel was such a young state, it made for a good model for nation building for the newly independent African states. Golda developed programs whereby engineers, teachers and sanitation experts could assist in development. Teaching programs in cooperative farming or road construction were also offered to Africans to study abroad in Israel. The relationships Golda cultivated and her personal charms made her extremely popular. One African leader at dinner said, you are like a mother to us. The diplomatic relationships she forged, however, would be overturned following the Yom Kippur War in 1973, when African nations turned against Israel in support of the Arab countries and the Palestinian nationalist government. Prime Minister Ben Gurion, with whom Meir began to have severe disagreements, namely over limitations to her ministerial powers and jurisdiction, stepped down in 1963. Golda carried on as foreign minister under his successor, Levi Eshkol, but retired in 1965. After under four challenging decades in politics, she craved rest and quality time with her grandchildren. But this was Golda Meir, a political giant. Ministers from the Mapai party pleaded for her to return to politics. She was a much-needed figure of strength and moderation to stop the ideological infighting which had broken out within the Labour Party. Just a few months after her initial retirement, she was nominated head of the Mapai Party. Most of her efforts over the next two years went toward building Labour unity, brokering between Mapai and the splinter factions on the left. By early 1965, Golda was 70 years old. Israeli success in the Six-Day War of June 1967 a war she had limited involvement in, and her own personal successes in uniting the Labour faction lent the impression her 40 years in politics had come to a natural conclusion. She retired, this time for good. 
or so she believed. Prime Minister Eshkol suffered a fatal heart attack in February 1969. Two other candidates, Moshe Dayan and Yigal Alon, were considered his natural successors, but each was considered unfit to lead and or a threat to the Labour coalition that had been so painstakingly built. Golda, once again, was urged to take the job. She was sworn into office on the 7th of March 1969, becoming the fourth Prime Minister of Israel, with overwhelming support from Parliament. Originally, she was only meant to be Prime Minister until the elections of October that same year. Few really expected Golda would take a liking to the position and stay on for another five years. On the domestic front, Golda mainly advanced the policies of her predecessors. She made further strides to sustain the Labour Party's unity, advance the welfare state, and carry on absorbing immigrants. Political historian Meron Medzini, however, attributes Golda's premiership with a rapid decline of the Labour Party. Under her tenure, the socio-economic gap between Ashkenazi Jews, that's generally European Jews, and Sephardi Jews, mainly from North Africa and the Middle East, widened, and ethnic tensions grew. These issues were not properly addressed. Sephardi Jews, now making up most of the urban working class, became increasingly disillusioned with Labour. Golda was also criticised for her dismissive treatment of the Israeli Black Panthers, a protest movement demanding equal rights and better prospects for Sephardi Jews. This all paved the way to the landslide victory of the right-wing Likud party in 1977, the first time the left lost its majority since the founding of Israel. But it was foreign affairs which dogged most of Golda's premiership. Golda was persistently dismissive of Palestinian nationalism or Arab claims to land in Israel. We'll do a deeper dive into her exact thoughts on Palestine in part two of this series, as it's something she's well known for. Her premiership was also marked by acts of terrorism in the name of Palestinian liberation. Infamous was the Munich massacre on the 5th and 6th of September 1972, during which 11 members of the Israeli Olympic team were killed in Munich by members of the Palestinian terrorist group Black September. In retaliation, Golda's government launched Operation Wrath of God, an assassination campaign by Israel's national intelligence agency Mossad targeting key members of Black September and the Palestinian Liberation Organization. More retaliatory assassinations ensued by Arab militants, including a foiled attempt on Golda's life while meeting the Pope in early 1973. Her premiership also saw the War of Attrition, beginning in March 1969. It was a protracted and bloody conflict with high casualty rates, mainly fought with Egypt over the lands of the Sinai Peninsula, but also, and to a lesser degree, with Syria over the Golan Heights. Both regions had been seized by Israel after the Six-Day War of 1967, becoming militarised zones to repel potential attacks in the future. Golda wasn't prepared to withdraw unless the Arab states showed clear signs to her of desiring peace. In August 1970, after repeated attempts of US mediation, a three-month ceasefire was arranged on the Egyptian front with the help of the United Nations. Egyptian President Abdul Nasser broke this ceasefire, taking the opportunity to halt crippling military losses, to stop US reinforcement of the Israeli army, while using the three-month period to construct shelters and move Soviet missiles close to the Suez Canal. For the next three years, a deadlock reigned. Several olive branches were offered by Nasser's successor, Anwar Sadat, and the UN made attempts at mediation. Golda generally dismissed these. She remained convinced the Arabs were bent on Israel's destruction. Unless they demonstrated real desires for peace, not armistices, she was not prepared to commit to four withdrawals from the territory seized in 1967 following the Six-Day War. Disaster struck on the 6th of October 1973. An Arab military coalition led by Egypt and Syria attacked Israel on two fronts, aiming to regain the occupied territories. They had planned the attack on Yom Kippur, Atonement Day, the holiest day in the Jewish calendar when most Jews would be observing the holiday or at synagogue. The war lasted two weeks and five days, from the 6th until the 25th of October, ending with a ceasefire brokered by a UN force, with pressure from the US and the Soviet Union. It was a horrendous war. Israel suffered between 2,500 and 2,800 losses. Many more Arabs perished, with most fatality estimates ranging from 8,000 to 18,500. The death and destruction not only pained, but shocked a grieving Israel. The surprise element of the attack was especially alarming. Most Israelis, including Golda, 
didn't believe a full-scale Arab invasion was even possible. Israeli intelligence, overconfident in Israeli military power, as well as the belief Arab countries were in no position to mount an effective military campaign, had failed to see or take seriously signs of the Arab preparations for war. The result was Golda was only alerted to an imminent attack on the night before the invasion, and she declared full mobilization of the army in the morning. The first few days of the war were catastrophic for Israel. Egypt pushed through the Sinai Peninsula, virtually unopposed, decimating Israel's fortifications, while Syria moved in from the north, crossing the Golan Heights. Defense minister and Israeli war hero Moshe Dayan seriously considered surrendering to the Arabs. The tide of the war didn't change until an enormous resupply program from the US took effect, fiercely negotiated by Golda, tipping the balance in Israel's favor. The historical analysis reveals Golda, aged 75, acted with formidable strength and decisiveness during the Yom Kippur War, particularly when others in her cabinet were breaking down. Unfortunately though, this isn't the impression many Israelis were left with, even to this day. The country blamed the government for its failure to prepare adequately for the war. A special commission concluded in a report from April 1974 that Golda was in no part responsible for lack of preparedness for the war, mainly citing military intelligence officials and field commanders instead. Nonetheless, popular rage at the report's findings discredited her government, spelling the end of her political career. Though she had been re-elected, she felt compelled to resign on the 10th of April 1974, leaving her successor, Yitzhak Rabin, to see through the peace talks with the Arab states. The Camp David Accords were signed four years later in September 1978, bringing peace between Israel and the Arab states after four bloody wars and countless skirmishes spanning three decades. Golda spent the next four years in her flat in Jerusalem, deeply unhappy. She followed Israeli politics and international affairs closely and remained highly active in the public sphere. When she found out Menachem Begin had been awarded the Nobel Peace Prize along with Egyptian President Anwar Sadat for their efforts in the Camp David Accords, she memorably said Begin deserved an Oscar, not a Nobel Prize. International praise and all sorts of honours flooded in from all over the world, with academies, streets and institutions named after her. Forever on Golda's conscience though were the Israeli soldiers who had died in the Yom Kippur War. She never forgave herself for not ordering the army's mobilisation sooner. She also became embittered with revisionist voices, faulting her for failures to make peace with the Egyptian president Anwar Sadat. Till the end, Golda was convinced in the correctness of her views, that the Arabs never wanted peace, only the destruction of Jews and the state of Israel. She published her memoir, My Life, in 1975. Three years later, at the age of 80, she died from lymphatic cancer on the 8th of November, 1978, aged 80. She was buried in the Pantheon of the Greats of the Fatherland on Mount Herzl in Jerusalem. So that's one heck of a life, I'm sure you'll agree. This was originally going to be in the usual format, but I couldn't quite see how to do justice to her life and all the international events during it in the span of 10 to 15 minutes. Golda was forged in the fear and deprivation of Tsarist era ghettos. In the openness and free-thinking spirit of the US, she found her life purpose as a champion for the Jewish people, long persecuted and repressed. Few figures in history can hold the title of founding mother, but she was one. She was in the region of Palestine for over a quarter century before the foundation of Israel, and remained active for over a quarter century after. She developed excellent relations with Americans, and particularly women. She was a gifted speaker with boundless energy, who could bewitch entire audiences with a passionate and plain speaking oratory. She gave her life to Zionism, and as Ben Gurion wrote, Israel's survival in the first Arab-Israeli war owes a great deal to Golda's astounding fundraising while in the US. She was a key figure during the British Mandate, World War II and the Holocaust, and was heavily involved, if not at the helm, in the Arab-Israeli wars. She held all key positions in the Israeli government before becoming Prime Minister herself, one of the earliest and few female leaders of the 20th century. Her life, by all appearances, has made her a poster child for feminists. But she was no feminist herself. 
She spoke disparagingly of its movements and its activists, often mocking them by conflating them with their extremes. From her teacher-aspiring days under her conservative parents, to her political career in a male-dominated administration, where Orthodox Jews also held political sway, she encountered many obstacles throughout her life. Yet she never saw her success as against all odds on the grounds of her gender. She felt she earned her success by means of hard work. She didn't use her power to champion equal opportunity and representation of women in Israel, always putting Zionism and the rights of Jews first. A titan of a woman, her complex personality warrants a closer look. Just like her life, she was a woman of extremes and a woman of many contradictions. Stick around for the next part where we look at Golda the woman. And don't forget to subscribe.